Who was Hecate to the ancient Greeks? Hecate was known as a goddess linked to the underworld, which is part of Greek stories about life after death. She wasn't just about the dark and gloomy underworld. Hecate was also connected to magic and mysterious rituals, often related to spells and unseen forces. She had special names like Nyctipolos, meaning she wanders at night, and Scotia, showing she leads dogs. These names show her link to nighttime and spooky things. Hecate was also important at places where roads cross, called crossroads, where people believed she helped make decisions and point the way. The Romans knew her as Enodia, highlighting her role in watching over paths and roads. She was respected as a protector of people, known by different names that mean savior, helper, and light bringer, showing her as a guiding and caring figure. There are different stories about where Hecate came from. Some say she was the child of the Titan Perses and the goddess Asteria. Others think Zeus and Asteria were her parents, or even that she came straight from the night itself, fitting her mysterious nature. Some tales say she was born in Sicily from Admetus and a woman from another land. Unlike other gods, Hecate didn't come from a big family, and she was seen as a very old goddess from Thrace, with special powers given by Zeus after a big battle called the Titanomachy. Hecate had many powers and roles, which sometimes got mixed up with other goddesses like Demeter, Rhea, Artemis, and Persephone. This mixing made her a figure surrounded by mystery, linked to special rituals, particularly in places like Samothrace and Aegina. In the story called the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, Hecate plays a special part. She and the sun god Helios were the only ones who saw Persephone being taken away. Hecate, with a torch in hand, helped Demeter look for her daughter, showing she protects mothers and young girls. After Persephone was found, Hecate stayed close to her, especially when she returned from the underworld, showing Hecate's role in guiding between the living world and the afterlife, which ties back to her connection with Crossroads. In ancient times, Hecate was known for her many roles related to the spaces where people enter or leave, like the edges of lands, city boundaries, doorways, and places where roads cross. She was also known for her unique position after the war between the gods, called the Titanomachy, as she was the only Titan who remained free. She stood between the world of the older Titans and the new gods, the Olympians, reflected in her various special names and roles in religious practices. Let's look closer at how Hecate became known as the goddess of magic. Initially, she played a smaller role in the myths about Demeter and Artemis, but by the 5th century BCE, we start seeing her more in Greek artwork and stories. She's often shown as a young woman holding either a torch or a key, symbols of her roles as a goddess of the night and a guardian of the underworld's gates, as well as a deity of boundaries. One piece of pottery from the 5th century BCE shows a scene where a woman is giving Hecate a puppy and a basket of cakes, which shows Hecate's diverse interests. If you know about Hecate, you might understand the importance of her often depicted with three faces, a symbol of her power and complexity. Sometimes she's shown as having three bodies merged into one, each facing a different direction, usually standing around a pillar called the Hecatea. The very first model of this three-faced Hecate was placed at the entrance of the Athens Acropolis, created by the sculptor Archimedes in the 5th century BCE. There's also an artwork from the 2nd century BCE showing a three-headed Hecate fighting a snake-like giant, accompanied by a dog. Because she's the goddess of limits, it was common to place her images at important spots like city gates, entrances to holy places, and the doors of houses. Now, about her animal forms. In ancient texts linked to magical traditions, Hecate is shown with three heads, those of a dog, a serpent, and a horse. Other times, her heads are depicted as those of a cow and a boar. In a special text known as the Orphic Argonautica, she's described in a scary way, with three bodies and three heads, a horse, a dog, and a lion. Why these animals? Lions, for example, have been linked to Hecate in early art from Asia Minor, as well as in later coins and writings like the Chaldean Oracles. The dog is especially significant because in ancient Greece, dogs were often sacrificed to Hecate. Although it's less common to hear about than other animals, dogs played a significant role in Greek sacrifices. In Homer's Iliad, we read about Patroclus offering two dogs as a sacrifice. Spartans also used to sacrifice dogs before battles for good luck. This practice was confirmed by archaeologists who, in 1937, found a well in Athens' main marketplace with the bones of hundreds of people and over a hundred dogs. An expert named Lynn M. Snyder noted that while the babies likely died from natural causes, the dogs were probably offered as sacrifices in a cleansing ceremony following childbirth, whether the baby survived or not. In ancient Greek stories, 
Dogs were often used in rituals to clean away the bad energy left by death or birth. These stories also tell of how dogs were offered to Hecate during rituals and left food from holy feasts. One reason Hecate is depicted with a dog's head might be due to the story of Queen Hecuba from the city of Troy. After Troy was defeated, Odysseus captured Queen Hecuba, but during their journey back to Greece, she killed the Thracian king and was attacked by the local people. In some stories, she jumps off a ship, and in others, the gods turn her into a black dog as a form of punishment. She then becomes associated with Hecate, the goddess. This story connects Hecate with Bendis, the Thracian moon and hunting goddess, similar to Artemis. Bendis, like Hecate, received dogs as sacrifices, but she was a distinct goddess, not just another name for Hecate. Besides the dog, Hecate also had another companion, a polecat or weasel, believed to have been transformed from a human as a form of punishment. There are different stories about this polecat's origins. One story says the polecat was originally the witch Gaia, who was transformed by Hecate for inappropriate behavior. Another story says the polecat was Galinthius, the midwife of Alcmene, who was turned into a polecat by a goddess as punishment for deceiving her, but then taken in by Hecate. So how did the image of Hecate develop in Greek mythology to become the goddess we know? Initially in writings like Hesiod's Theogony from the 8th century BCE, Hecate was honored as a goddess with power over the sky, land, and sea. The idea of Hecate as a figure of the underworld became more common later and was not mentioned in early epic poems that talked a lot about the underworld. However, later texts show her playing a key role there, linked to her earlier associations with crossroads and boundaries. Over time, Hecate became known as a goddess of cleansing, turning away harmful forces like demons, ghosts, and other negative influences. She was seen as a protector of homes, keeping out unwanted spirits, a role that matched her duties as a guardian of borders. By the 5th century BCE, her connection with spirits became more pronounced, possibly because of her similarities with the Thessalian goddess Enodia. This goddess, known for wandering the earth with ghosts, was depicted with attributes similar to Hecate, such as wearing a leafy crown and carrying torches. By the 3rd century BCE, writers had firmly placed Hecate within the underworld context. The poet Theocritus mentioned Hecate's connection with the underworld by talking about her holding keys, suggesting she controlled the opening and closing of death's gates. The Greek magical texts also view Hecate as the keeper of the keys to Tartarus, the deep part of the underworld. Later, the Roman poet Virgil portrayed her as having influence both in heaven and in the underworld, showing her alongside the gods of the underworld. This role as a keyholder and guardian might link her to Cerberus, the multi-headed dog who guards the underworld's entrance to keep the dead within its bounds. However, unlike Cerberus, Hecate has a special role as she can lead souls back to the living world, a point I mentioned earlier in discussing Greek beliefs about the afterlife. By the first century CE, Hecate's association with the night and the underworld had made her a symbol of witchcraft, magic, and sorcery. In Lucan's epic Pharsalia, a witch calls upon Hecate, referring to her as an aspect of Persephone, showing her as a decaying, eerie figure who must mask her true form when visiting the heavenly gods. Additionally, Hecate's connection with the moon arises, especially in Roman times where she is blended with Diana, the huntress goddess, because of their shared attributes and symbols. This merging results in Hecate being linked with all three realms, the sky, Diana, the earth, and the underworld. Hecate herself. The connection between Hecate and the sun god Helios, especially in spells and literary references, supports the idea that she also represents the moon's qualities. But this direct link between Hecate and the moon becomes more apparent in Roman times rather than in Greek tradition. Therefore, I prefer using Diana instead of Artemis when discussing this aspect to emphasize the Roman influence. Though there's no early art linking Hecate directly to the moon, Remember our discussion about the Homeric hymn to Demeter. It describes Helios and Hecate as the only gods who knew about Persephone's kidnapping. This collaboration between the sun and the moon figures could symbolize their joint role as celestial watchers, able to see and reveal events on Earth from their unique vantage points above. Therefore, it could be said that Hecate's role next to Helios shows that she might symbolize the moon in this story. There are other instances in ancient Greek stories where Hecate is connected to the moon. For example, in a lost play by Sophocles called The Root Cutters, there is a line that calls the sun, the sphere of Hecate off the roads, suggesting a link between Hecate and celestial bodies, although Hecate is not directly mentioned as the moon here. We don't have the rest of the text to understand this better. Then, in Seneca's play Medea, 
The character Medea calls upon Hecate, referring to her as the moon, the night sphere, and a goddess with three forms. Other old texts also show Hecate and the moon goddess Selene being mixed up with each other, along with different deities from Greek and other cultures. Later on in ancient Italy, the mix of three moon goddesses, Diana, Luna, and Hecate, became common in art, especially in sacred forest scenes. Here, Hecate, also known by the name Trivia, which has been said in different ways, marks places where paths cross, along with other boundary deities. And yes, to add to the confusion, Trivia was a name given to both Diana and Hecate, which made the two goddesses seem even more similar, to the point that the Romans celebrated Diana's multiple aspects as Hecate, Luna, and Trivia. As time went on, the earliest ideas about Hecate before Greek times were mostly forgotten, and the way Hesiod wrote about her integrated her into the Greek gods. The idea of Hecate as a goddess of the underworld didn't really stand out until Greek playwrights linked her to themes of witchcraft and death. From then, her connection to dark magic and evil became more central, until by the medieval era, European stories mostly showed Hecate as the goddess of witchcraft and the moon. Thank you for discovering the enigmatic Hecate with us. If you enjoyed unraveling the secrets of ancient mythology, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more insightful content.